Listeners beware. There's no turning back now. You've entered the Horror Apocalypse Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome to a very special episode of the Horror Apocalypse. Today, I am on vacation, but uh, we got an excellent opportunity to come down to Expedition Bigfoot in Cherry Log, uh, Georgia. And uh, the owner has been very gracious to grant us an interview. Uh, Would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Expedition Bigfoot? Yeah, my name is Dave Becker, and uh, along with my wife and I, we built this about three and a half years ago. It started as a small idea, like a little family attraction. But over the three and a half years that we've started it, it's actually almost doubled in size, doubled in the amount of uh, exhibits, and uh, we're getting ready to actually add on to the building. Nice, nice. I know uh, we've we've been here the last two or three years. We we at least make at least one trip down here because mm-hmm. it's it's fun, and I noticed a few uh, new things compared to the last time we were here. Um, what was what was your inspiration? What made you decide you wanted to open up a Bigfoot museum? So my brother Mark and I saw a movie back in 1973 called The Legend of Boggy Creek. <laughs> and I think that's probably what started for a lot of guys and gals, actually. Uh, and it had such a, it, it rang such a strong message in me. It really sparked my interest, especially growing up in Florida on the edge of the Everglades. And um, we, I had already seen uh, all kinds of articles and news reports about the skunk ape being sighted in Florida as I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. And to us, it was just a it was just a matter of fact that people were seeing this large primate. It was never like a joke or a, a funny thing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that was my inspiration. Yeah, there was uh, Legend of Boggy Creek. They did a Boggy Creek 2 and then a Return mm-hmm. to Boggy Creek. And mm-hmm. I think that helped spur on a lot of um, Bigfoot-themed movies. Uh, there was a Primal Rage just, I believe, last mm-hmm. year where you actually, in there, they refer to him as the Oma, which you don't really hear that name very mm-hmm. often um so that's that's fantastic I, I didn't know a movie was what uh got you started with that yep yep and uh of course i've watched i don't know how many movies since then of course some are better than others i kind of like the movies that are i mean because the in actuality the reality the real stories of bigfoot are so interesting you almost don't have to make one up you mm-hmm. can just pick one of the interesting encounters and um i think they would probably add a lot more to a movie some of the good ones have been out like um um, oh my goodness! What is that? Something in the woods. Probably one of my favorite uh, independent productions because it was all based on uh, an incident called the uh, Cowman of Coppola Beach, which happened out in Washington back in the fifties or sixties. The um, the uh, homestead actually still stands or it's been abandoned, but uh, I like it when you you can infuse real history with the story as well. Yeah. Well, uh, speaking of real history, let's let's talk a little bit about some real history. Um, there was uh, probably the most popular video. It was the Patterson, uh, was it Gimlin? Yeah, I just want to make sure I pronounce mm-hmm. it correctly. Patterson-Gimlin film, uh, almost 40 years or more ago. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because uh, there's a lot of people that have come forward and said that they were the one in a suit. Um, then other, you know, those stories have been disproven because someone else has come forward and their story contradicts. So what, what's your thought on that? Do you, do you view that as a valid piece of evidence or yeah, not? Or? Oh, a- absolutely. It's actually the, probably the single most important piece of evidence. And because of that, it's attacked by all sides, mm-hmm. by interested parties that want to make sure that this, this, um, this remains in the realm of myth. Um, in fact, if you if you like experts and you like science, then I would recommend that you check the expert's opinion on the uh, suit supposedly used to make that film. And uh, not only did Walt Disney uh, executives say that we didn't have the technology to make it, the man that played uh, most of the apes in the uh, back in that time, 50s, 60s, and 70s. He had to hand make his own costumes. He was the number one ape who had his own costume. He said that he couldn't make that costume. And uh, and if people remember that this is a film, this is way before video and Photoshop. There's no way to trick on that uh, uh, that film. Um, so, yeah, in my opinion, and, and, and many other uh, researchers have been doing this for a long time. It's absolutely genuine, hundred percent genuine. Of course, when you zoom in, you can see that this creature has mammary glands. Who in their right mind, especially back then when making a suit would be very difficult, would you add mammary glands? So, I mean, 
And then Bob Hieronymus, the man who said he he's the one that made it, he could never come up with a suit, could never name the person that made the suit. And when you see him standing with the suit, it's a different suit that somebody else made, I think, 40 years later. And even that suit is terrible. Mm-hmm. So if you do some basic cursory research, you will find that, in fact, um, that film is 100% genuine. Yeah, I, I know a lot of the, the films that were coming out in that time frame that had... Uh, actors that had to wear a giant suit. They were very big and bulky. In this particular video, the creature does seem to, to move with a little bit of fluidity. Um, not so bulky as some of these actors in suits do. Now, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I have a very open mind. I tend to um, accept people's thoughts and opinions. Uh, but I, I am very skeptical. I, I, go, I approach everything with a little bit of skepticism. Um, I think that helps keep it... Uh, healthy. You can have mm-hmm. a, a decent conversation on both sides. And that's one of the things that I pride myself on is I like to be able to be a devil's advocate and argue both mm-hmm. sides of an argument. So when we go forward, I hope you don't take any offense. I, I may ask some questions from a skeptic's uh, point of view, but that's just to get some information about it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, you mentioned, you know, this suit uh, had memories and, and so on. What... Um, when we see a lot of these photographs, sketches, videos, they they seem to be... Uh, mostly male, or at least mm-hmm. that's the interpretation that we get. What are some differences between the male and female? Because we really don't see very much of a female. So there's many reports of females. The thing is that um, even a most of the photographs are blurry or from a distance. So even if the female had mammary glands, you probably wouldn't be able to see it. It was probably just a fluke. They were able to get a close enough um, v- uh, film of Patty. Uh, back then where you could actually see this memory glands. So the, uh, there's no doubt that some of the photographs people get of these are of females and they do have memory glands, but there is such a difference and the film quality is so poor that you can't tell it's a female. Um, I've taken several reports where females have, have uh, um, approached uh, people, whether at campsites or, um, or uh, at, at their homes. As a matter of fact, Bobby Short, the uh, nurse who had a sighting, I think it was in Florida back in the 90s. She's the uh, lady that started um, Bigfoot Encounters website, probably still to this day the most complete listing of sightings uh, around the world, not just of a state, but around the world. And she, the, uh, hers was spurred by a sighting of a female while she was camping and using the outside nature facilities. And uh, when this female came walking through her the little clearing where she was using the bathroom, she looked at this female, and it was such an old, tired female that when it looked at her and they locked eyes, Bobby Short said um, that she had a feeling that this old female Bigfoot had such a hard uh, life, such a hard life. Maybe she was tired that it had a profound effect on her soul um, uh, and for the rest of her life. So, yeah, there's just as many sightings of females, I have no doubt, as males. Now, um, speaking of sightings, have, have you had any... A personal experience with sightings or evidence that you've discovered or anything along those lines? 2010, I was on a, an investigation at a commercial fisherman's property in Alva, Florida. And I guess we, we were there because they were there the night before. So um, we knew they were there. And after about an hour and a half, two hours of us being there, we had a thermal. We had a little tent set up away from the away from the fire. And he was playing music and he threw some fish heads in the smoker. And he said, that's what draws him in is the f- smell of fish. Sure enough, an hour and a half later, uh, we could see two of them come out of the swamp and standing behind trees. They stayed there for about 10 minutes. We passed the thermal around and observed these two peeking at us from behind trees. Very clear thermal image. Um, of course, the, at the time, we didn't have video. Uh, we weren't attached to video, so we were just observing them. So. But we watched them for about 10 minutes. We all took turns, and they turned and walked back off into the swamp. In 2012, I was bluff charged by one in the Green Swamp, which is just east of Tampa, Florida. Uh, When I was checking my cameras and uh, putting new batteries and camera cards, I had some cameras uh, along the power line route. I did a wood knock on my way out, and something came completely unglued in the woods, and the swamp came crashing out. I could hear this thing crashing out towards me, and I was by myself on a mountain bike with nothing but my camera bag, batteries, a backpack, and my wood knocker. And before this thing busted out of the woods, I chickened out and uh, hightailed it back to my truck. There was nowhere around me. And, I, and of course, at the time, I thought, how ironic that my the thing I've been looking for is about to come crashing out. But it sounds so <laughs> PO'd. I don't want to. Be, I don't want this to be my first encounter with face to face daytime encounter with one. 
And in 2013, I was uh, had one push a tree down at me when I did a wood knock up in North Florida, just south of Tallahassee. Uh, on a beautiful, clear day, I did a couple wood knocks, and my response was a big, healthy tree come crashing down about 75 yards from me. I couldn't see what did it, but it, all the years I've been in the woods, I've never had a healthy, green, snapping, popping tree come down in the middle of a calm, beautiful day. So, so those are my uh, those are my personal encounters. Nice. It seems very frightening. <laughs> it can be very frightening. Yeah. Now, um, mention Florida a lot. You mentioned that you were from Florida originally as well. I'm, I'm originally from Michigan, but I, Michigan. I grew up my ex-military, my dad's military, my brother, myself, my uncle. So I was stationed at the Hydrofoil Squadron in Key West, so I spent a lot of time in Florida. Okay. Well, I know in uh, Florida, it's mostly known as the Skunk Ape. And then we run into uh, other various names, Sasquatch, Yeti, all kind of culminating under the, the title Bigfoot. What are... Are there any major differences? Like, for example, one of the, the footprints I see in the museum almost looks like it has six toes, while most of the others seem to have uh, five, and I think there's one that has three. And what are, are there any other major differences between, say, a Yeti, Sasquatch, uh, Skunk Ape, Ulma, so on? Mm-hmm. So that's actually actually a big part of the mystery, is that how can you have this rare, rare species, yet we have subspecies? So there's, there's something I think a lot of researchers are struggling with and trying to fit into the parameters of reality. If there's only a few thousand, how do, how do we have subspecies of a few thousand? So we have three-toed prints, four-toed prints. But most of them are five-toed prints, but there's a few six-toes. So, um, so we're, we're quite sure that there are subspecies of these creatures and uh, that there's a lot more sightings than what you read about on the internet. When you opened up three years ago, or three and a half years ago here, there's probably only five, four or five sightings on our map of the local area up here, about 50 square miles. Since we've opened up, we've had so many people come in here that had sightings, daytime eyeball sightings, that we had to take the artwork down and uh, and uh, add, I don't know, my God, there's probably 40, 50 sightings that's just 50 square miles. Right. And it would be the same thing if it was in Kentucky or North Carolina. There's nothing unique about this place. Mm-hmm. Um, any place else where it was forested, it had some terrain, it'd be the same thing. So, in, in, in fact, the stories we're aware of are a, a minutia, probably less than 1% of the real encounters that are out there. And when you can get those people to come to you to tell you, that's when the learning mm-hmm. really starts. Well, like I said, I, I do tend to approach things with a bit of a skepticism. So one question that I think plagues my mind and a lot of other folks' minds, with so many sightings and so little um, video and photographic evidence, what, how, how do you think they can stay hidden for so long? How do you think they, they stay under the radar for so long, especially with so much of our, our land being you know, populated now? Mm-hmm. And I understand that, that there's... I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. I understand that you know, there's, there's a small percentage of this uh, world, be it you know, underwater, on land, that we actually occupy. There's so much more that we don't know. But, I mean, for so many sightings, mm-hmm. um, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of physical evidence to it. So that's actually a very fair question in, in the I come in two parts. So that first part of that answer is is that we assume they're hidden because we don't see about it on the news at night when we turn the TV on and it's not on the front page of the newspaper. So we always assume that if somebody saw a Bigfoot, well surely I'd open up a newspaper and there would be a story there. But in fact when people see these things they never call a newspaper. They never call NBC, ABC, or CNN, or Fox News. Hey, can you come down to the house and interview me and my kids so the world can see I'm the crazy man? So there's this <laughs> perceived ridicule factor already attached to it. So, unfortunately, the rare, um, the rareness is nothing but a perception because of our lack of information that's being fed to us. So that's, there's that, that half. The other half is that uh, these things have been killed. So when people, well, where's the bodies? Well, the bodies exist, but they're not on display for you and me to see. Right. And when you, when you realize that, when you start digging through the history books and you find all the newspaper accounts of giant skeletons found four or five at a time sometimes, uh, resembling a large monkey, um, when, when you see those newspaper reports and then you read that the Smithsonian came in, picked them up, and they're going to study them, and then later on when the uh, institute that turned them over to the Smithsonian, I'm talking about the early 1900s, 1800s, and the Smithsonian's answer was, 
what skeletons. Right. It doesn't take a lot to put together that there's a concerted effort to keep this information away from the Americans. Mm -hmm. And if you're an inquisitive person like I am myself, I naturally want to know about that stuff. There's a reason they're hiding that from us. So most people can go through their life. It doesn't matter to them. You can live and die and live a happy life and know, never know anything about these things. But, uh, in fact, it's not the only thing that's being kept from us. And when you realize that, well, then your interest becomes tripled. Right. You become even more interested. So a lot of guys that are into, and gals that are into Bigfoot, it's not the only thing they're into. You realize there's a lot of secrets kept from us. I know... Um uh, for example, uh, back in, was it the 50s, the, the Roswell crash or, or whatever, I noticed, um, and this is my own personal interpretation, when that something like that happened, yes, that's an example of things that are, are kept from um, the American people or, or just the people in general. Uh, but from that point to now, we've had such a gigantic technological leap that it's kind of hard to, to sit there and say, well, how much of our technology that we're using today possibly stemmed from any technology that was found in that particular crash site. So I can understand from, from that point of view, what would you think would be the purpose for them hiding something like this from the American people or keeping it under wraps from us? It's because Bigfoot comes with a lot of baggage. Mm -hmm. So so it, it, you, when you realize it's being hidden from us, a concerted effort to be hidden from us, then you have to realize it's because it's not because of the, the um, it might close down the timber industry because they've been hiding these things, the existence of these creatures way before we had any kind of, of uh, forestry service. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, there's, a, there's a grander secret to these things, which I think reflects on us. So in, in a nutshell, if we found out who Bigfoot was, then we'd find out who we were, and that's really what they're hiding from us. Right, like the missing link. If you say so. Yeah. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Um, so let's let's take it back to a little more about uh, the science of a, of a Bigfoot. Um, and I, I saw your, your sign in there that showed the one of the largest skeletons being like 36 feet tall that, that's been found. Um, there's a sign about the, what a Bigfoot has been known to eat. Is there anything that you would say is... Uh, typical dietary habit because obviously they're not going to constantly come across roadkill that would expose them too much to you know the general populace and, and things like that what do you are there a lot of animal carcasses that are found obviously obviously berries and brush and things like that mm -hmm. but what what else do you think is part of the dietary habit of a bigfoot so um they've concluded through talking with uh, bear researchers because the these things have the exact same diet as bears mm -hmm. and anywhere there's bears there's bigfoots and um, uh, look, you don't you don't get a lot of uh, reports of Bigfoots in deserts as well as you don't get bears. You know, the, the wetter, the swampier, where there's black bears, where there's uh, freshwater fish, where grizzly bears, that's where you're going to find Bigfoots. So um, um, they they figure they need about 10,000 calories a day per full-grown animal, and they don't travel alone. They usually travel with a f mate. Sometimes it's a small group of males, young males. Sometimes it's a, a large male, a female, and one or two children. Sometimes it's even tag along like an older female. So it could be groups of anywhere from three to six. Okay. That requires a lot of food. And, um, and on the boards in the museum, I actually went through the archives of John Green, each every report he ever did, and picked out where the creature was actually observed eating something so uh, the display in here talking about what they eat is what they've actually been observed eating not what we think they might eat or what we imagine they eat is actually what they've been seen eating but the only two things that are curiously i found that they have not been observed eating is citrus and tomatoes really yeah okay I, what about tools do you see them uh using any kind of tools so very few reports of them using any kind of tools, but uh, there are a few out there of them using sticks, kind of like a chimpanzee would get uh, uh, termites and ants. There have been few reports of them using those, but there are reports in, out of China of them having the ability to, to uh, they've, they've not, they have not how to make a fire. Okay. Well, yeah. that was another thing I was going to ask mm -hmm. is, I mean, they, they seem to be very human-like, and not long into the history of... of um, uh, cavemen and so on. Mm -hmm. there, there's depictions of them using fire to cook food and things like mm -hmm. that. Do you, is it only in China that we do we see that report? Or I'm only aware of the reports of them using fire in China. Okay, there, there could be here in the United States, but I'm not aware of it. Okay. Um, 
probably one one question. I was probably going to save this for last, but I got I got to get it thrown out there. Are they, in your perception, are they a threat to us? Um, I think any large species, whether it be bear or shark, anything that eats meat, um, some of them, a small portion of them, I think, really don't like us. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think a vast majority of them either don't care for us or actually have some pity for us, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, when people say they're afraid of us, it kind of makes me laugh because they're the apex hunter in the woods. And I can promise you these have, things have no fear of us. Uh, they can outrun us out. They can outdo us in every, in every any way. Um, so, um... Well, I mean, figure if they're not using uh, tools, but they're uh, omnivores, they're meat eater herbivore, then they have to get their meat somehow. You know, oh, yeah. if they're not using tools, they're hunting with their bare hands. So, yep. so they get in your garden and eat your. They'll eat your asparagus and beans, and they'll eat your chickens. And then I talked to two different people that have had them. Well, I've seen them walk off with a calf under their arm. They eat hogs. They eat just about every uh, every. Th- Every kind of meat out there, and the Indians spoke of them eating their children. Mm-hmm. So, and, I mean, really, you just can't discount that stuff. You right. just can't. Uh, you have to pay attention to it. So, um, yeah, so I think a few of them can be dangerous to us. Well, and I believe one of the videos uh, that was playing, they talked about, you know, throwing rocks at you, mm-hmm. and, uh, throwing boulders off the, you know, the tops of hills and mountains and, and things. Um, so that's what kind of spurred that on. Uh, obviously, we're invading their territory, so they're mm-hmm. going to defend um, but there's been no, you don't think there's any reports of them actively uh, going after a, a person? Do you oh, think? sure. Or, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And That's I'm just being brutally honest, and I don't want anybody to listen to this, that imagine these things as, you know, the gentle force giants. The vast majority of them will not hurt us. Matter of fact, there's probably just as many reports of these things helping children and lost injured people in their woods as they are as there are of these things harming mm-hmm. uh, uh, people. But a few of them, there are stories of them unprovoked stalking humans, and um, so it does happen. But I don't think that's any reason to lump all these things into together as uh, harmful to humans. We just have to be realistic. That's all. Right, and I mean, like you mentioned, I mean it's. It, it's a little hard to look at this story that's been handed down for for uh, thousands of years. I mean, we have art depicted, as you show in the museum here, back to the 13th century. Mm-hmm. You know, art being depicted of these these creatures. They're all over the world. It's not just uh, to a central location. I and mean, we've got North America, we've got uh, China, Africa, even um, South America, all over the place. And it's a little hard for something like that to start with a rumor and spread worldwide in that land, be alive for that long, that length of a time, for it to not be either proven real or, or, or wrong. So like a, one of the videos said, if it is a hoax, it's one of the greatest hoaxes in, in all time. So um, now I, I did see, too, that they're, they're coming up with more and more prints that are showing um, uh, dermal ridges. Mm-hmm. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so uh, when you have people in the woods that are have casting kits with them or have in their car or they're close to home, um, you can cast these prints, and if they're fresh enough, made in the right kind of substrate, like a nice soft mud, uh, you can actually get them with the uh, dermal ridges, which is the raised ridges, like similar to what our fingerprints have. And Jimmy Chilcutt examined one of the best prints made in uh, Griffin, Georgia, back in, I think, 1994. And um, this is an expert, a science man, who obs- who looked at the print and said this was absolutely a real print made by something seven and a half to eight feet tall. It has the the outward uh, appearance of a human, but the dermal ridges run more like that of a gorilla. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't match the human print. So, you know, when people ask me where the proof is at, if an FBI fingerprint expert doesn't look at a cast and, and made by a sheriff's deputy and says it's genuine, I mean, I don't know what, what more proof you're looking for. I mean, I know that you want a body, but you're not going to get one right. ever. You're never going to ever, ever get a body. Um, so and if you can't look at the the evidence as a whole, and there's so many different kinds of evidence, and, and you still you, – you can't look at all of it and think they're not real, or at least there's something there. If you still wander through life thinking this whole thing's a joke, then you've never taken 10 minutes, just 10 minutes to do a cursory examination. Right. of the evidence available to everybody. Now, I'll say, um, 
last night when you uh, when you agreed to the the interview through the message which again thank you so much for that um i went on and i did a quick little brush up and it, just in 30 minutes of of uh investigation to come up with some questions and some talking points that i wanted to bring up there was a ton of information out there a wealth of it um but one thing i did see is that there doesn't seem to be any dna evidence hmm. what about that well, that, that's actually a very controversial facet of the study right now, and that's because when they were first getting samples, blood samples, um, well-collected, carefully collected samples, and the uh, when the scientists would look at it and they would find human DNA in there, well, they immediately said, well, it's been contaminated. There's human DNA. Of course, that's the bias of the person that's uh, doing the test. After about the fifth, sixth, seventh time of doing it and finding human DNA, it finally dawned on the investigators what was going on and that these things, their blood contains human, they're part human. Mm -hmm. And that's why they're finding the markers, the human markers in there. So, um, and now, of course, if you have a, what you think is a Bigfoot blood sample, if you take it to a lab, they're not going to test it. And if they test it, it comes up as unknown. They, were not, they won't put their names on it right. because everybody works on grants. Nobody wants their name attached to a Bigfoot blood sample. And you came out and said... <laughs> That it's a Bigfoot. And in fact, they can't say that anyways. All they can say it's inconclusive or non-determined. Mm -hmm. and, and just a cursory examination of the blood starts at $2,500. If you want them to run through everything, it could be ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Right. So, so um, the DNA, enough of the DNA has been, has been looked at and it contains human. It's part human. Mm -hmm. And uh, that should be give enough people a direction to look in to look a little deeper, and when you see that, then you start to understand why this is hidden from us. Right. Well, hey, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me and, and have this discussion. It's I, I'm in awe. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to, to talk about? Um, I, I think specifically that that uh, I, we love to inspire uh, children, uh, preteens, like I like I was inspired when I was young. So. That's really what this museum, this whole museum is designed to. I'm not trying to convince anybody that Bigfoot's real. That's a personal decision for you to make. But at least when the kids come through here, they see the kind of things that got my mind, got me asking questions to myself and, of course, questioning what I was being taught in school. And, uh, and if I can do it, if I can plant that seed for kids to start thinking for themselves, um, then I think I've done my job. I don't think there's any growth without questions and curiosity, and I think this does a great job of, of starting that discussion and getting questions and curiosity out there. So I thank you for that. I really do. Um, you want to go ahead and give a plug? Let them, let everyone know where you're at. And yep, sure. We're located uh, right on 515, which is also known as Appalachian Highway, right in between LJ, Georgia, and Blue Ridge, Georgia, which is about 90 minutes north of Atlanta. And we're and during the summer and fall, we're open seven days a week. We're only closed on Tuesdays. In the winter, and you can find us on Facebook and our website as well, Expedition Bigfoot. Excellent. Well, thanks again. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Anytime. Have a great one. <laughs>